Hey guys, thanks for joining me and Michael tonight. I'm excited to get started, but I want you to know at the very end of this presentation, we're going to give you a very, very powerful and unique special offer. We're going to teach. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. We're well prepared to serve you, but make sure that you stay to the end if at all possible or you'll miss out. Let's get going. Welcome, 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 welcome. I am down here in Costa Rica. I just got here last week. Michael, are, are you on the line yet? I am on the line from Nashville, Tennessee. Why do we say on the line? What does that mean? I guess because they used to have wired phones for everything back in the olden days, right? I guess so. But the internet is connecting us. No, we're excited to be here. We're going to get started, everybody, in just a minute letting other people still log on and whatnot. I know it takes a second, so we'll just enjoy some really cool pictures of monkeys and Costa Rica and stuff. Very hot down here. Okay. Hey, nice to see everybody. All right. Well, hey, we titled this, Michael. Well, I kind of titled it, but you went, went with it. <laughs> the ultimate breakout session. And some people might not even know what a breakout session is. What is a breakout session to you? Well, for me, the breakout session is a uh, separate, smaller presentation where you can go deeper and learn more in a deep way with more depth than you can in a keynote speech or a presentation to a whole room. A breakout session typically has some question and the answer, question and answer at the end, but really it's about going deeper and not just giving kind of information vomit um, at one, all at one time. Yeah, I agree completely. And, you know, one of the problems with trainings I've done in the past is I put so much stuff in there that people feel overwhelmed by it. And I don't want to do that. So tonight we're going to focus on the top three pain points for cleaning businesses because I already know what they are because I survey people. We have thousands of people on our email list. We send out surveys once a year and the top three pain points are very simple. And really not surprising. Number one is employee issues. And <laughs> that means different things to everybody. I mean, it really does. I mean, because if you're just an owner operator, your employee issues isn't the same as a guy with a $800,000 business that has, you know, 30 people or something, right? So we're going to talk about employee issues and the systems that Michael used and I used in our companies to blow through these different plateaus and to really grow. The second one is financial uncertainty, and I mean, hello, we're entrepreneurs. The financial uncertainty thing is a mega, mega problem, right? Because it can feel like feast or famine, especially if you have a small company. The third pain point is how to find new customers. Where are they hiding, Michael? How do we find them? I don't know. That's a great question. No, <laughs> well, well, great. I guess we'll just end the webinar right now. We'll just end the training. Yeah, call I, it good. I misunderstood. No, I know that you know. And, you know, so let's take a minute and do a brief intro for you and for me. I'll let you go first. Give us just a nutshell version of who you are and what you've accomplished. I mean, don't be overly modest. Just tell us the facts of what you've done with your business. I know you have a team of people. It's really big now, but it wasn't that way in the beginning. Can you unpack that? Yeah, it wasn't really big in the beginning. We started in Minneapolis, and it was just me uh, guy getting a random call out of the blue from a business broker who wanted to sell this business that came with uh, no real employees. He had one employee who was so overweight that he actually didn't fit the classifications for the ladder, so he couldn't actually climb a ladder. Uh, <laughs> it came with an old cargo van that was breaking down. We called it the creeper van. Um, it had almost no equipment that was usable. The pressure washer didn't have the correct hose and the correct fittings, um, those type of things. It had no physical location. Its sales had been declining for four straight years, and the manager of the business was uh, being charged with a felony for embezzling money from the owner of the business. So this thing was uh, moments from being closed down, shut down, never to be reopened. If someone didn't buy it that week, the owner owned a different business and he was going to go. And uh, for some unbelievably crazy reason, we decided, yeah, gosh, you know what? I'm going to buy this business and I'm going to clean windows. Uh, we had to fire that employee because he couldn't um, clean, he couldn't do the he physically couldn't do the job. Um, that first year, we had a total of three people at our peak. 
Um, and I was the window cleaner. I was doing everything, just like you say. And my three biggest issues at that point were financial uncertainty. Is my wife going to be able to you know, buy groceries and feed the, feed the family? Uh, what are we going to do if something happens? She was still working at that time. I was very nervous about getting new employees. If I stayed at 60000 I knew I couldn't accomplish the goals I wanted uh, to do um, from a growth standpoint. And then as I was hiring, um, I had to fire the first employee I hired because I didn't know how to do a proper background check and then found out after the fact that there was um, criminal charges that we couldn't allow them to go into people's homes. So at that wow. point, I was having those exact same pain points that the people on the ladder were having, where I was financially uncertain, I needed to get new customers, and I had employee issues. Mm-hmm. If we fast forward to where we are today, um, we're in se- we have seven o- offices, I believe. Um, sometimes it's hard to keep track because the team's growing so fast. We're in, we operate in seven or eight states. Uh, we have five uh, actual, uh, what we call locations. We're in Portland, Oregon, Cleveland, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, Minneapolis, and now St. Louis. Um, we went from having just two services, which was window cleaning and pressure washing, to now we have 23 services. Um, we have a 135 employees, roughly. We have 12 managers. We have four leaders. Um, and where I sit today, my three biggest issues are financial uncertainty, how to get, how to keep growing so that we can accomplish our vision of being in 42 different markets uh, with a full service platform, and you know dealing with those em- employee issues as well. So they're different, but my pain points are the same. And I'll tell you what. Um, there's different points that you got to decide what your vision is. And we decided that we wanted to be a big company. And the, the, I, I'm, I can tell you that I'm having a lot of fun today. Um, and I'm not having to, to work Saturdays as much and be away from my family and my kids. So I'm having a lot of fun. I hope that's a good enough intro for you. Yeah. Uh, well, nobody it's, special. It's very interesting. We just got, yeah, nobody special. I'm just like every guy that's out there listening to this right now. I'm just very fortunate to work very hard at this business and breaking through the cycle with some help from the outside. Well, the thing is, though, is that everybody works hard. Well, not everybody, but the people that watch trainings like this, they they work hard. They want to figure it out. But it's not the hard work, right? It's working on the right things in the right way that is the difference. And we're going to get into specifics with that. But, you know... (laughs) Your business story is kind of hilarious. That first employee, was that the guy that wore the, this is my beer drinking shirt to his like first day of yeah. work with you? Yeah, it is. The first day I met him, he, his shirt was a cutoff shirt, and it said, this is my beer drinking shirt. And he met his new boss, the owner of the company, wearing that. Um, he was smoking cigarettes, swearing. I mean, he was everything about, uh, and I'm a, I'm a blue-collar Midwestern guy. I like hanging out. With uh, simple, hardworking farmers. I mean, I'm not flashy in any way, shape, or form, but this guy took obscene to a whole new level for meeting your new boss. <laughs> oh, my word. Well, my intro, uh, I feel like a broken record because a lot of people listen to my podcast and stuff, but I started with a 93 Chevy Cavalier with a 28 foot Warner ladder strapped to the roof. So a lot of you guys have seen that picture. And it was extremely humble beginnings. I didn't know what I was going to do to grow the business. I just was hungry. I was hungry. I would consume information and learn and struggle and fail and knock on doors. And I would get up really early and come home really late and just do stuff every day, meeting people, knocking. And it just, it, it was a grind. It was a grind. It wasn't until year two for me that I really stumbled upon this concept of the e-myth. I had a friend named Wesley. He had a tree tree business. And his business, he was only 26 years old, and they were going to do about 600K that year. And they were cranking. Now, that's a totally different business model. And he wasn't making almost any money at all. He was working 100 hours a week. That's a real number. We shared an office together. He had a pillow and a blanket in there. And me and Wesley were both so young and hungry, but we didn't understand how to work on our business instead of in it. We were slaves to it completely, 100%. But when he found the e-myth and he started unpacking what it was to me, I feel like I had my aha moment because in all 100% honesty, like you said, Michael, um, there's nothing about me um, that's different than anybody else except that I followed to grow my business. And it's so 
powerful to have something like that. It really changes everything. It did for me immediately. In fact, the next year, I tripled my business just like that. Boom. And I was still doing almost everything wrong. But even small changes in, in strategic areas changed everything for me. And let's get into some of the, the teaching and training. You know, I don't want to keep people waiting. Uh, but what I've done, we talked about the three pain points for businesses because you have the employee issues, financial uncertainty, and how to get new customers or how to grow, right? Well, there's different stages in your business. So there, first, I'm going to talk about the categories. So category one to me is the owner operator. And that's a small business. And then if you're doing over a half a million, you're kind of becoming a quote unquote big business. Okay. But when you're in the middle, okay, have you ever heard the phrase stay small or go big, but don't go in the middle? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that philosophy. Yeah. So the middle for me, and I work with hundreds of people, right around the 300,000 mark, you know, you could be at 250 and you could be at 400, but right in that space, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of weird financial cash flow issues that happen as you're having these growing pains. And what, what I see happen, Michael, is people get stuck there for like 10 years or 20 years. They'll grow, 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 and they flatline and they can't get out of that. And so I try to help people go through. You got to go through the middle, but you don't want to stay there very long. You want to blow right through it because uh, once you get over that half a million mark, things get a lot more simple assuming you don't have you know ridiculous amounts of debt and things and that can complicate things but to me those are the different categories the small medium and large Uh, but when you're working in the business you as the person watching this training i see your uh, evolution as a business owner as five steps with any kind of home service company number one is when you are the guy primarily on a ladder that's step one you know you're in the field you're doing the work That's step one. Step two is when you're primarily working in the office. You're doing payroll, you're doing scheduling, you're on the phone, you're doing all the paperwork. That's kind of your deal. When you're primarily there, that's step two. Step three is if you're primarily selling. You're the sales guy, you wear a nice clean shirt, you drive a nice truck around and you are doing bids and shaking hands and kissing babies and (laughs) networking. Like if most of your time is spent doing that, you're in step three you know, or phase three. And then the fourth one is when you're the general manager. The general manager is a guy, you have an office person, you're the boss of them, you're managing that. And you have a salesperson, you're managing that. And then you got the crews and you're managing that. That's step four. But step five is really the ultimate destination, which is to be a business owner. And it doesn't mean you do nothing, but it means that you can monitor your company, that it becomes a little box with moving parts and machinery and mechanisms in it. And, and, it, and it spins and it does. We put a dollar in the top, $2 come out the bottom. That is an amazing thing. And you've accomplished that. I've accomplished that. Uh, my story with the ladder in the car, you know, that little business, I grew it to the month we sold it. We did about 186000 that month in revenue. I only worked three to five hours a week for the last two years I owned that company in the business. I played ping pong in our ping pong room and, you know, had a a Diet Coke and would talk to the operations manager, the operations liaison, the sales manager, the office manager, the crew leaders, right? We had a full team and it, it might feel impossible, but it's not. So do you have anything to add to that before we keep digging? Just that I think Diet Coke is disgusting. I'm drinking a, <laughs> a regular Coke right now, and uh, it makes me want to no longer be friends with you. I can't believe you drink Diet Coke. No, I I completely ag- agree um, with everything you said, Josh, from the stages. We went through them all. Uh, that middle stage, one of my, my uh, our leaders on our team, Derek, calls it cash flow purgatory. Um, and even in our locations that we have now, we're going through those same steps uh, where we are going from a small business to a large business. So I can feel for where you were and I can feel for where you're, you're the listeners and the people that are on this call right now or uh, are both when I started and what we're going through today. Yep, it's it can be painful. And Diet Coke, you know, if you notice, mostly like, now I'm not even going to say it. Well, no, I'm, I'm committed now. But I notice really thin people don't drink Diet Coke. You know, just just something to take note of. And I'm one of them. Like, I'm, I got like a little chunk going on, you know. I'm not super lean. And I'm drinking my Diet Coke. I'm like, is, this isn't working. What, what, am, what am I doing? Anyway, no, I'm, I digress. So, employee issues. So, let's talk about it, Michael. I want to give people specific systems, things they can do, things, ways that they can look at these problems 
depending on what stage they're in in their business. So you're the guy, you're just trying to hire someone to help you because you're busy, but you're on the ladder. You're at stage one. You're the guy on the ladder. You need to hire people. What do you do? Yeah, so um, for us, what we did uh, is we started recruiting everywhere we possibly could. Um, even uh, a local uh, addiction recovery center after people had been clean for 13 months, if they didn't have st- uh, bad records as far as stealing and things like that, we would consider even hiring them. We were trying to hire from every source we possibly could. So we were putting ads on Craigslist. We were putting ads on Indeed. We were asking everyone we knew. We were posting to our personal Facebook accounts, and we were hiring. Now, when we started, um, the biggest issue that we had, the biggest point pain point um, the first couple of years with employees was our lack of training them. The issues were really our fault because we didn't know how to handle it. We would just say, hey, uh, I remember this guy Carlton came, worked for us for a day. The second day we had too much work. One guy called in sick, so we sent Carlton out to clean windows by himself. Never dealt with the customer, never dealt with our CRM, nothing, and just said, hey, call me when you got a problem. we got to get this done. So we had high turnover. We had high customer complaints. Our customer satisfaction rating uh, started with a 7 on a 1 to 10 scale, 10 being the highest. And what we did then is we adopted a system that said we're going to take our team through a series of steps. When we hire somebody, we still think even as good as we – as much as we hire, we still think we got to – if they're not coming from a team member referral – no matter how good they interview or how bad they interview, we think it's still 50-50 if they're going to work out. Team member referrals, we think it's probably 90-10, but gosh, interviewing, we're still not that great at. But let, once let they me, get let me in, stop you there for a second because this is good stuff. And what I'm hearing, okay, because I, I, I got some objections for you, okay, because there's people that are working in the field. They don't have time in their mind. They don't think they have time, and some, some of them don't have time to do all this, you know, recruiting and all this stuff, right? So what do we do to fix that? That's one question. And then I also want to comment, the thing that I think is interesting about what you said is that you took massive action. So you didn't like put one Facebook post or an ad in the newspaper or hit Craigslist a couple times. No, you, you pushed hard. And most of us do just enough to fail, especially when it comes to recruiting because the, the labor pool out there is sketchy, man. <laughs> it's, it's great. You got to interview a lot of people to get one gold nugget. You really do. And when I was small, just my two cents, the friends and family and referrals of people that knew me was definitely the place to start because you're going to get a higher caliber of person. Now, when you're hiring, you know, 50 people every spring, you, that you can't. You got to do more than that. But when you're the guy in the ladder for that phase one or even in phase two in the office, I think referrals from existing people that work for you and family and friends is, is critical. But whatever you do, you push it hard and you try to generate lots of opportunities to talk with a lot of people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And here's where I see um, the issue. You know, the person who says, I don't have time to recruit and I don't have time to do this. Yeah, you got to go to family and friends. You got to do everything you can. But if you don't, uh, Dave Ramsey calls it, you got a bunch of stacks on your desk, right? And you go, I need somebody to help with these stacks. So I got so many windows to clean. I need someone to help clean with the windows. And there comes to be more and more and more. So you hire somebody, you don't train them, and then they come and they quit. And as soon as they quit, the stacks grow even bigger. So really what you need to do is you need to look at it and go, okay, we know for us that if we hire somebody off the street, we'll take um, our maid service division. We know we have a uh, 75% chance that if we hire somebody that they're going to make it through training. We have a 57% chance um, that they're going to make it through 90, 90 days. So only about half of the people that we hire actually get either we say, you know what, you're not the right fit, or they say the same. Now, window cleaning, we're way better than that. We've only been in the maid service business for about 11 months. Window cleaning, we've been for four and a half years. We're really good. I think we probably lost one person um, in the last year and a half. So we're way, way better. But we interview a lot, and we know how many we we need to interview, and we know that a lot of them aren't going to make it through our system and our training. We're very, very rigid. So if you're not going to make it here. What about the little guy that doesn't have that yet? I mean, to me, your first couple hires 
aren't they like the most important hires of your life? I mean, aren't they just massively critical? Like, because if you're on the ladder and you need to get to being primarily in the office, whoever you're picking to start out with can really delay any kind of chance you have at growing, or it can just rocket ship catapult you if you get the right people. I mean, I'm not saying you just hire and pray that they save your day, but how important is the personal investment in that first hire and that second one and casting the vision? Because I don't have the systems yet. I don't have percentages of whatever. How would you tell that guy who doesn't have that and he doesn't have time to build that yet? What should he do to get from the ladder to the office? I, you know, Josh, you might be better at it than me because our first – I, our first year, we hired, I think, five or six people, and only one of them made it through the next year. So we were casting the vision. We were teaching um, how to do the systems, but we just knew that we were going to have to work really hard to get a lot of people there. And we didn't have a lot of people that we were referred to from friends and family. Um, the guy that's, that made it through and he stayed with us to this day is uh, someone that came off of Craigslist. So I would, uh, I think it's critically important. And I think treating your people with respect and casting that vision is really important. But I also think uh, you really got to make sure that you get the right guys and you get enough of them so that if somebody quits um, or doesn't show up for work one day, you're not uh, out there you know, trying to clean $2,000 worth of windows by yourself. Yeah. Yep. So let's, let's recap this real quick. So if you're on a ladder or you're in the office and your business is small, you're in the first couple stages, right? You're getting close to the middle. Whoever you hire, you better be obsessed with investing in them, motivating them, inspiring them, leading them. That doesn't mean, you know, all rah, rah, cupcake stuff. You might not have all the systems in place. That's totally fine. You, your enthusiasm and your in your leadership and your communication skills can make up for it. You need to have you know weekly meetings and things like that. So your very first employee is a terrifying thing. It can be very intimidating. Uh, it's also intimidating for companies to give up control. Right? They don't want to get off the ladder because the guy isn't going to do it as good as they do. You have to get over that. You have to coach them through it. Uh, and then once you want to go to level three and four, you're going to have some more systems. When, once you're the sales guy primarily or you're the general manager of the company, you're going to have a basic interview process in place. But you don't have to worry about all that stuff today. Hit it hard. Don't do just enough to fail. Interview a ton of people. Get lots of referrals for friends and family. And the person that you pick, you have to be all in, and it's risky, investing in them, caring for them, being strategic. You know, I had a calendar of all my employees' names. The, their wife's names, their girlfriend's names, um, their kids, their hobbies. Like I wanted to understand these people, and I put a, 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 basically a, an investment calendar. And I, it was a personal relationship investment calendar. It was just a spreadsheet, a Google Doc. No one knew it existed except me. But I made sure that I, on a reoccurring basis, I never forgot to pull someone aside, slap them on the back, and say, "Hey, I just want you to know that I see what you're doing. Like you're doing this great. You're doing that great. Here's here's a gift card. Take your wife out to a dinner. Whatever." I did that stuff constantly, and I really believe that was one of the biggest reasons I was able to get out of the truck into the office, get into just sales, and get out of the business entirely so quickly was those personal investments. Um, do you have anything to add before we move to financial uncertainty? No, I think that's great. Well, we, we, uh, I would say make sure that you train up your people on the technical aspect of the job uh, first. And then I would, uh, what we did was we made sure that they were technically capable so that they could be out on their own so that I could be in the office. But then we did that. We tried to make them all feel like we we're working towards a common goal. So they went from being an individual contributor to a contributing team member. And we wanted them to always feel like part of the team. So yeah. when I was still out cleaning windows, that was our, our goal, was to make them feel like they were part of the team and that they were loved and valued. And one of the easiest ways to have a technical training system when you're tiny is you make a list of like five family and friends. Like we had, you know, my mother, my mother-in-law, my neighbors, some friends I had in the area. And for someone to get trained, they'd spend basically one day with me and they wouldn't, weren't allowed to do anything. We just, I'd teach them some basic skills and techniques and how not to scratch glass and go over the basics. This is in the beginning when it wasn't overly complicated. And then I would send them to do full jobs by themselves at all these, my friends and family's houses. So they'd spend like four to five days just doing the work, right? And I would be out running the business and they'd be back there doing that stuff. And I'd check in with them and I'd give my mom and my mother-in-law a little form and they would just write down 
what their impression was and how the quality was. And did the guy say the script right? And did he do this? Did he do that? So you could set that system up in like 20 minutes by sending an email to friends and family. And then when you hire someone, you spend one day with them, even if it's a Saturday or Sunday, then you let them go clean windows on people you know's homes. That by itself will help a lot rather than just throwing them into the field. Another problem, and then we'll move off of this, is I talked to a guy actually this morning and they do over 300000 in revenue. Really smart guy. He's got a small team. He's breaking at the seams. He needs to hire people, but they're in the middle of their busiest time of the year. He has no time to train. He, has, he, he can survive it without hiring someone, but it's a desperation situation. And so my advice to him was don't do it. Wait. Wait until the fall when you have clear space to think and you need to build an onboarding and a training and a retention strategy for your employees. And then in the spring, do it the right way. Because if you just do a Band-Aid over, the, over it, it's just going to be a disaster. Do you agree with that? I wholeheartedly agree. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. It's better to just slow down and, and stop the growth for a minute, put the system in place, and then do it the right way. So anyway, financial uncertainty. So look, like I said already before, I, I'm just a regular guy, man. And when I was just out working hard and grinding, I remember year two of my business, my I had a car repossessed. I had my wife's debit card declined at the grocery store in front of strangers. She ca- called me crying from the parking lot. It was a very dark time. It was extremely um, discouraging. I felt like an utter failure. I wasn't a failure, but I felt like a failure. And a lot of people struggle with this. And one of the biggest problems I see is that they commingle their accounts, right? And I don't think you probably did that since you bought a business in, in the beginning, but I was much less sophisticated than that. <laughs> and a lot of people, they just put all the money in one account and they pay their Verizon bill and they pay, buy groceries and they get their personal gas out of this one account. And that is a total disaster. So when you're in stage one and two and even three, you cannot, I mean, immediately, if you take anything away from this training, immediately stop commingling your your money with your personal expenses and your business expenses. There's a million comments I'm sure that you have on that, right, Michael? Yeah, um, I didn't uh, do that, so I agree with you on that. And the reason I didn't do that is because I didn't take a paycheck for the first two years. So um, there, all of the business money stayed in the business for the first two years. And personally, we lived off of savings and my wife's income. Um, she was still working at that time. Yeah, well, you had a super awesome advantage there. I'll give you that. But you know what? I want to make a point here. You could have taken money out of the business, right? But you did it on purpose because you would have choked it to death and you couldn't have scaled. And that's another problem with the financial uncertainty is people suck a massive percentage of their revenue out of their business in personal income because they want everything right now. You know, they won't wait till tomorrow. Uh, Have you ever heard of the marshmallow experiment? Was that you telling me about this? I don't think so. So they give these these kids, this was back in the 70s, they give these kids two options. They give them a marshmallow and they stick it in front of this little like seven-year-old kid. And they say, hey, you can eat this marshmallow if you want. But if you don't eat it in an hour, I'll give you two marshmallows. <laughs> and they're just studying these kids. So like a whole huge percentage of people just ate the marshmallow because they just couldn't wait. They're like, screw it. I just want it right now, right? But then what they did is they followed these participants in this study for like several decades later. And the, the correlation between the people who would wait and delay the gratification with the, their level of success was you know, astronomically higher than the people who couldn't do that. And I think that is a big part of the financial uncertainty. It was for me, you know, I would suck out an extra grand and to do that little weekend getaway, I would try to sneak out that 500 bucks and go buy something for my car or I don't know, spend it on something stupid in the beginning. I wasn't doing it on purpose to sabotage myself, but you feel like you need to reward yourself when you're in it and you're grinding. And that's probably because of a lack of vision for the end game. What do you have to say about that? I think that's you just nailed it so on the head. You know, the no commingling funds is, is should be a given. I, I did it with a previous business, um, and it was horrible. I absolutely uh, recommend it. But for me, and I don't know where the guy listening to this who's on the ladder or who's at that 200,000 level, but for me, it was so scary to think about being five years down the road 
and still be doing 60,000 with guys who wear this is my beer drinking shirt working with me that was so scary to be at that level for you know 5 years down the road that I was willing to take all the sacrifice I could up front to get to a point where I knew my life would be completely different five years down the road. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at it and I said, gosh, we want to be in multiple markets. This is where we want to go. I want to have freedom. I want to be the business owner like Josh. Um, that, that was so exciting to me. But what was even more was how scared I was to be thinking, I, I don't want to be here next year doing the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. that is why moving uh, – that there was financial uncertainty in every step and every investment we made. But it was overwhelmingly cast aside when I looked at the uncertainty of trying to be in the same spot I was today, two years from now. Oh, that is so true. I mean, you have a strong why. I mean, you're, you're hungry. Some people just are not hungry. If you're watching this training and you're not really hungry, you know who you are. It's going to be very difficult for you to really scale and have massive results. It's probably impossible. You got to want it. And uncertainty is not bad. Uh, but you have to manage it. And risk isn't bad, but you want to take intelligent risk. One thing that small businesses do too that screws them is that they buy too much stuff with their money when it's the wrong time. So the phone's not ringing and you, and you have a little cash because you just came out of your busy season and now you're, it's slowed down. And so what do you do? You go buy a piece of equipment. You go buy a pressure cleaning rig trailer super vortex 9000 thing <laughs> and you park it in your driveway and you drool over it because you feel so freaking cool that you just got this water fed pole, RO, DI, whatever. But that, that was a mistake. That's called a capital expense. So you take a lump of money and you spend it on metal and tires and equipment and whatever but your phone's not ringing. And that is also a terrible, terrible thing. It just keeps holding you back. You have to spend money on marketing and scale and growth and spend money on taking care and investing into your employees, which is totally overlooked, like we talked about a minute ago. And that money has to come from somewhere. So have you seen that to be true with anybody you've helped or worked with? Oh, my gosh. Over and over and over again. Um, and for us, this is the rule that we use. And this is part of our secret sauce. And I'm going to give it away um, but we will not exchange value dollars okay we get certificates of good deeds from our customers we call them dollars we won't exchange that for something that the customer won't exchange it back to us for so would they exchange it for um, would they exchange more money more of their dollars for us to have a nice uniform yes would they exchange more dollars for us to do a pressure wash with a $5,000 machine versus a $500 machine? No, they would absolutely just want their house washed. So we would never exchange our money, 5000 bucks, for something that could do the same work as a $500 machine. And we took all of that savings, every single dollar we saved, and pl plowed it into client acquisition. Because yep. it's like people you said, are scared to market. They won't spend a thousand dollars on marketing, but they'll spend fifteen thousand dollars on some equipment. And there's something broken in the mentality there that's really holding people back big time. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I don't. And I don't. I don't know what that is. But um, I would encourage everybody to just think through that. Is the customer going to give us more money because we made this purchase? Right. Is, Here's the they, argument. I can already know what people are thinking listening to this. They're saying, well, you know, I get it for pressure cleaning as an example. You can get these really sweet, you know, hose reel, electric hose reel, eight gallon a minute machines where you can wash a house in 45 minutes instead of three hours, right? And so your profitability for the job goes up because you have a more efficient process now because your system, your machine is better. And that's valid. But that's not going to scale your business. What that does is that makes you more profitable, but it doesn't grow your business, though. And so especially if you don't have enough volume, enough customers, enough revenue, if you're not growing like a rocket ship, there's nothing to optimize anyway. You don't need to worry about extracting the highest dollar per hour yet, right? Isn't that something you do in the back end as an executive of a bigger company? When you tighten things up, you make a capital investment because you have the volume and you can show the return and whatever. But these little businesses that we're referencing, they don't understand that, right? Yeah. You know, and even as a, um, you know, running a almost $5 million business now, we still built our own roof cleaning machine and probably did it for less than a thousand bucks. And our soft wash pressure washing machines are less than a thousand bucks. Um, so even at that level, 
Um, and nothing against that if that's what you want to do. But for us, we're still not even pay, putting that much money in. And we're, we're probably cleaning $100,000 worth of roofs this year and, I don't know, soft washing $300,000. do I'm not really sure exactly where we are. But our machines are still under 1000 bucks. I guarantee every machine that we're using is under 1000 bucks. Well, the people that are technically obsessed with technical perfection, they're crawling out of their skin right now because they're like, oh, but, but when I wash the house, it's so much better because blah, 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 blah. And you know what? You're right. It is better when you have the $15,000 machine or whatever. But guess what? The customer doesn't know it's better. The perception isn't any different because Michael, your customers love what you do and they give you all those dollars, those certificates of good deeds, their house is washed, their expectations are exceeded because of all the processes you have in place. So at the end of the day, do you want to be technically proficient and perfect and be, you know, a a cocky little pressure cleaning expert guy, or do you want to grow a business? Um, There's not a wrong answer, but I want to be clear that those two mentalities totally contradict each other, right? Absolutely. Completely agree. Okay, so let's keep moving here because I want to get into uh, the boot camp and explain to people what that is at the end here too. Uh, But before that, let's talk about finding new customers. So in the beginning, when you're little, you have no money, (laughs) but you have time because you don't have any work. So in the beginning, for me to acquire customers, you just have to have a raw hustle. People are scared to go knock a door, to go... uh, uh, network at a realtor event or to go to your local chamber of commerce thing or go to a B&I group, they're kind of scared. And again, like with other areas in our businesses, we do just enough to almost make it, just enough to fail, just enough to have moderate to boring results from it. And you have to be, you know, Grant Cardone, I'm not a big fan of Grant Cardone, really, but he has this book called The 10X Rule. I haven't read it, but the idea is whatever you think you need to do to accomplish your goal, multiply it by 10. And I agree 100% with that. More action. If you don't have money, use your feet. I called that bog marketing, boots on the ground. I actually had bog as part of our sales manager's routine. It was literally a thing we talked about all the time. There's certain times every week where he did bog sales uh, because it's important. What did you do to get new customers when you didn't have money and you just fired the the, the big fat beer drinking shirt guy what did that look like for you in the beginning, and what would you do different if you could go back there now? Yeah, we hung door hangers. Uh, you pretty much nailed it. We hung. I, I know that between us hanging them, meaning our team, early on, and then we ended up hiring a, team, uh, a company to do it. That was a lawn care company. So we partnered. They paid for half the door hanger. We paid for half, and we were both on there. We both distributed. I bet. I, I know that the number's over two hundred thousand door hangers, Josh. Um, <laughs> We, we started out the first year, it was like 10,000, and then the second year we put in so much. So we were door hangering every, all the time. And I know your company, Send Jim, you got the 5x5, five five, or the, the houses right around that house. I love that concept. We did that every house, you know, one to the left, one to the right, one across the street, and one to the left and right of that. So we were out there door hangering. The second thing we did was we invested in flyers in the newspaper because they were cheap, you know, little inserts. Yeah, yep. Um, and then we started tracking. Okay, well, we know if we're just door hangering all day, we could put out about 350 door hangers if we really, really hustled. And if we were doing uh, $1,000 into the flyers in the newspaper, how many, what was our rate of return on that? So we were trying to develop that system of a dollar in equals $2 out. And what we found over time is that the, both the door hanger strategy and the, um, uh, the flyer in the newspaper were about a dollar in and a dollar out. So mm-hmm. we'd make our money, but we would, if they came back, if that customer came back, then we were profit. We were very profitable. Oh, right. So we were, oh man, now we could get into lifetime value and all that, but I want to pause for a second because this is something that drives me freaking crazy because I want to help people. Okay. But people don't understand things sometimes. And this is a big one. They think, that marketing doesn't work. Oh, direct mail doesn't work. Or, you know, I can't knock on door. They, they can give you a list of 100 reasons why they can't do something. But at the end of the day, you have to get off your butt and make it happen. Well, I can't afford to buy door hangers. Well, then get a cheaper apartment. Then turn your car in and buy a beater. Like, are you going to make the sacrifices to make this work or not? Because it, really, it's all up to you. It's all on your shoulders. He'd passed out 200,000 door hangers, and people are on Facebook saying, yeah, I'm going to get 400 door flare, you know, hangers out this month. That you can't, that's nothing. That's insignificant. We have to have massive 
push. It creates a tidal wave of momentum. And on the back end of that, the only way you'll even know if something works is by having a big enough sample size of doing it in real life for long enough to actually get accurate metrics like your customer acquisition costs. You know, I've had people use Send Gym and they send out 30 cards and they get a $5,000 job. And they think, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. Well, that's not an accurate sample size. That's not going to happen every time. And then other people send out 80 cards. And the only person that calls them is someone mad that they took a picture of their house. And they say, ah, this doesn't work. No, it does work. You're doing it wrong. And this is true with all forms of marketing. You have to do more than you think if you're ever going to get accurate metrics, which are so critical later. They're so freaking critical. It's unbelievable. But it starts with just the volume. And we would do the same thing. We'd order 20,000 postcards at a time and do a bomb. We just call it a bomb, all hands on deck. Uh, I just don't see a lot of guys doing that. Yeah, I love the way you call it massive action, Josh. That is so what we believe in. And we've done it in multiple different stages. We did it in that early stage. We did it about three years in where we did a massive action into radio. Um, and that was huge for us, but it was financial uncertainty. We were going to invest $50,000 at that point into radio. 50000 we didn't have. Luckily, it was over the course of the year. But we said, hey, we got to try this. And it, it worked. Um, and now it's our best thing. We were just on, on a full day thing. So we've taken massive action in marketing. If people saw our marketing spend and what we've done, that's the difference. You got to create margin somehow. If you're in there, that spot where you say, I can't afford it. You either need to create more revenue or decrease your costs. You have to create the margin That's to right. be able to to do this. The only two things you can do, increase revenue or decrease costs. So That's if right. you can't cut any of your costs that, and you don't have the money to invest in the marketing, the only thing you have is your time. Yeah, if you have to go sleep in your parents' basement to build your business for two years, then do it. There's no shame in that at all. At all. It's the opposite. That's amazing. In fact, most of the people I hang out with, that's what they did. <laughs> they they cut everything out and said, I am going to freaking win and I am going to get 10,000 customers and then they do it. But guess what? They don't do that and have a bass boat and a brand new car and go on 10 vacations at the same time. In my keynote last uh, couple weeks ago, I said, Mark Cuban, you know, he worked for seven years straight in an apartment shared with a bunch of other guys without taking a single vacation. That's what it takes, guys. That's what it takes. Now, I want to keep moving on here because there is some other things. When we say that we want to find new customers, really what we're really saying, Michael, is we want more money, more revenue. And so it, sometimes finding new customers, uh, we get obsessed with it, but we neglect, we overlook all the really simple things we could do immediately to get more revenue, right? So if your average customer is a $200 value to you, or you can put an upsell system in place or a better referral system, or you can answer your phone better, or you can start making outbound calls better. These are all free activities. They're just systems, the way that you do these things. You could generate that same amount of $200 a different way. And I call this the low-hanging fruit. I see people, they'll spend five grand on EDDM direct mail. But then you call them. They don't even answer their phone. <laughs> or they answer it and they're like, hello, right, or something. <clears throat> they don't follow up after they're done with the job. They don't offer a walk around and really give a, a high-level five-star service to the customer. They don't stand behind their product if there's a mistake. They don't ask for referrals six times. They ask one time once in a while. And they think they're doing it right, and they're not, right? So all these little things, let's talk for a couple minutes about what we can do on the back end, just in our processes, to generate more revenue immediately, like immediately. Got any thoughts? I got some. Yeah, so um, I completely agree. And again, creating more margin. One, um, the easiest one is you can raise your prices, and that's going to make people fall off the ladder. So grab a hold both times. But we've uh, raised our prices 30% since we started. Um, people kept buying, and we did a really good job. So if you're doing a really good job, you have the ability to raise your prices. Um, and if you have more work than you, if you don't have enough work, um, don't raise your prices. But if you got too much and you say, gosh, you know, I'm working every day, but I don't have enough to afford that, you can raise your price. The biggest thing we did year one and year two, Josh, is we focused on upsell. 
So on the job, how can we take a $187 average scheduled job and turn it into $250? Now, I can be honest and say we didn't get the $250 those first two years. We did not get there. But when we're out there, we upselled screens and sills. We upselled screen repair. We upselled gutter cleaning. We upselled the chandelier that nobody thinks about when they talk about on the phone. We did a lot and a lot of upsell. And every day the guys would come back and they would we would sit around the table the next morning and say, how much did you get an upsell yesterday? And the goal was always 10% of the job every day. So we would just sit there. And, and then the guys who got eight would get ribbed on. And then we get a, if you get $1,000 of upsell this week, you get a jacket, a Blue Skies jacket. It's $55 for this jacket. But that, that cleaner just cleaned $1,000 extra that I didn't have to pay for with marketing dollars. That's right. So we had these competitions then about upsell. So everything that beginning uh, to create that margin for us, we were investing a lot into marketing. But when we booked the job, it was only 187 And towards the end of the second year, I think we were about 220 was our average job size because we were so focused on making sure we could serve more needs of the client when we're in that home. That was I'll the biggest tell, thing uh, for me. I, my average ticket my first year in business was $130. When we sold, it was $450. Okay, yeah. And the, the reason it went up is very, very simple. I created a document called the Customer Lifecycle Document. And I coupled it with a training program that's very, very simple for technicians. And the Customer Lifecycle, what it was, it was a way for us to visualize all the opportunities we had to engage and touch and, and connect with that customer. And those are all opportunities to generate more revenue or solidify the relationship or create more perceived value. So when you feel the phone call from a customer, it's not just a phone call. That is a serious touch point opportunity. So you have to have a strategy on how am I going to answer this type of phone call? What exactly am I going to say to make sure I over communicate and over deliver on expectations? How's the, the voice inflection and tone of my voice going to be so good that for every 10 people I do this with, four of them hang up and go, wow, that was that was amazing. That company was so nice, right? All those things are little pieces of margin like you talk about. When we did upsells, we had two things. Number one, the way that we upsold something was by using a technique that I made up called I noticed blank, I recommend blank. We didn't say, hey, we also do gutter cleaning, Mr. S- Mr. Jones. Uh, would you like us to do it? It's 100 bucks. We, we didn't do that. That doesn't work as well. And look, do that if you're doing nothing. But what works better is to say, Mr. Jones, I noticed that your gutters are clogged. And that can cause uh, water damage in your basement. I would highly recommend you have that cleaned. Is that something you were going to take care of or would you like us to do it for you? That one system. Now, make no mistake, that sentence, that script, that's a system. We beat it into the heads of the technicians. That's how we did it. And it, it, our average ticket climbed, right? The customer life cycle, we asked for referrals in the same way six different times throughout the process of them doing business with us. That raised our average ticket. That created margin, created margin, everything. And then at the end of the job, we'd leave what we called a service point checklist, which was this little brochure with a picture of a house with these little white boxes with lines pointing to the siding, pointing to the windows, pointing to the driveway, pointing to the deck, pointing to the roof, pointing to the gutters. And And we would write in a smiley face on all the things they did not need. But if they did need something, we would write a price on it. And at the end, we'd say, hey, we do this as a courtesy for all of our customers. We documented these prices. This is a service I would highly recommend you have uh, done. And now you have the information for it. You know, blah, 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 blah. All those little things. And you could do this in two days worth of work, staying up late and figuring it out. Uh, It can change your entire company almost right away. I mean, it's, it's very powerful. What do you think about that? Uh, I think I'm going to send you a 12 pack of diet Coke for that line, because I'm going to make so much more money off of the, I noticed, um, this, this is the pain that will happen. And then this is how, what I recommend. Are you going to take care of that? Or uh, I think that's beautiful. And I guarantee that on Monday morning, when I send out my message to my production managers, that's going to be a part of it. So <laughs> I, I'm going to send you. I'm stealing that. I would send you as payment twelve pack of Diet Coke. <laughs> well, you got to send it to Costa Rica. The the that, international freight's going to kill you. 
I don't care. It'll be worth it. I, I bet you I bet you this week we'll make an extra five thousand dollars from that comment right there. You that's will. amazing. And, it, and it's I, good that is because amazing. the techs don't feel like they're selling. And the techs like to work outside, they like to clean. They don't want to be a sales oh, guy. Stop it. making your techs be a used car salesman. You need to be a professional recommender of real needs. You know, if someone tried to upsell something to someone that they did not need they were written up at least and fired if they even hinted at it again. Um, so a future opportunity for us was something that is a bona fide need. You don't just walk around trying to upsell a bunch of crap. You upsell the chandelier because the chandelier is dusty. You upsell the deck washing because there's mildew and it's slippery and they could fall and break their neck, right? These are real things. And when you couple that with all the stuff we're talking about, money just happens to you because you're providing valuable services to people. So now I'm all fired up. Yeah. Well, let me get a little more fired up, Josh. Are, is the customer life cycle thing, I've been in your boot camp and I've looked at it and I've went through the process. Is the customer life cycle thing in there that you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That's in there. That's one of my favorite documents. And we had it printed off and actually as part of our onboarding process. So even new employees that came in that knew nothing studied and learned and were explained the customer lifecycle document. Um, I, I cannot believe I missed that. I'm going to steal that too. Um, don't make me pay for the boot camp again, but um, <laughs> I'm going to no, steal no, that no. too because that's worth its weight in gold. I, I, if we could get our, I mean, right now we're a bigger business than most of the guys, but let's say you know we're doing, I think, somewhere around 5,000 customers now a year in just window cleaning. But if we were to take even back in that early days when we were doing 100 to 400, if, if we did 400 customers and we got another $10 because of what you just said, that would be 4,000 bucks. That would be two grand if, you, if you're paying your guys 50%, which you shouldn't be, but if you were, that'd still be two grand, two grand. That would pay for the boot camp. That would pay for marketing. That's unbelievable. So don't make me pay for it again. But I am going to go back in and steal that. Our team needs to be working on that too. Well, he, here's one of the problems with the boot camp, and we are going to explain it because I have a you know an offer, a very, very, very good offer at the end. But I want to unpack what it is because honestly, I haven't done a great job of explaining what the boot camp is, how I built it, why I built it that way, and who it's for. Okay, there's a lot of confusion because I have my podcast, I have the growth fall, I have all these things going on. The boot camp is a very specific, high level thing. I'm going to tell you what it is right now. I'm going to get you some screenshots up here. We're going to show some video backgrounds and stuff so you can see what it is. Because uh, it's a lot more than just a bunch of trainings like what you're watching right now. It's a very immersive, interactive experience to walk you through the thousand things that we didn't talk about tonight, okay? Because there's so much stuff, we just can't cover it all at one time. I shot the core of the boot camp in Costa Rica. There's 46 videos shot in Costa Rica on the beach, on in the mountain in, in the back of my house. So there's really, it's hundreds of feet up. It's really beautiful. Uh, I, I made these videos and they're all small. They're bite-sized chunks speaking to one specific thing, one system. Because you got to remember, I'm not Yoda. I don't have all the answers, but I, I have the framework that works. The things we're talking about, it's not a question if it works. It always works. When you say, I notice blank, I recommend blank, it always works better than saying, hey, do you want to hire us to do this? This isn't theory, okay? This is what I did to win. And you can have it. But the thing is, is so you don't get overwhelmed with it, you get a lifetime membership to it, and you go through these modules, and each module teaches you the point that we're talking about in each video, because each module has multiple videos. It teaches you by text, because you're reading the video itself. There's audiobook links to my audiobook. You know, people pay $100 just for my audiobook. Uh, there's all this stuff in there. There's a course workbook, so you're actually handwriting down as you're going through. There's a homework guide. It, it gets you to actually document where you're at right now, where you want to go, and then we lay out how to make it literally happen, not from a place of theory, not from a place of wishful thinking, just the boring, simple processes that you need to implement one at a time. And we help you do that over the long road to, to grow your business, right? There's a video in the boot camp that I use to land a, a single account worth over a quarter million dollars. And I've had people <laughs> message me and say, hey, I just wanna pay you just to have that one video. You know, it's worth hundreds of dollars by itself, right? 
all the strategies. There's over 50 internal document samples like the customer life cycle, like our financial spreadsheets and how we did our budget and how we'd build our cost structure out and all that stuff. You can have it and just put your info in it. And then you have a system that I built through pain and suffering <laughs> instantly. It's crazy. So you have the bootcamp core with all those videos, bite-sized chunks, modules, the workbook, the homework guide. That's almost 50 pages of really beautifully designed, thought through um, guides to help walk you through the process. There's no pressure to do this all in five minutes. You don't have to log in and overwhelm yourself. You do a little at a time. There's also a private mastermind Facebook group just for the boot camp. It's like the growth fault, but it's better. The reason it's better is because everybody in there has invested in growing their business, systemizing their business, building something they could sell someday, and they're focused on that one thing and they're going through the boot camp together. Uh, if that's not enough, there's more. There's a lot more. You also get three personal phone calls with me. And I'm not gonna do this forever because there's gonna be too many of them. I have four kids. <laughs> But you get these three calls so we can go deep on some specific thing that's hanging you up, holding you back or whatever. My specialty is financial stuff, the numbers, understanding the, the structure of how to get from A to B. I can do a lot of things to help you. I record the calls and then I send you a link to them so that you have it to reference. Uh, there's also three, uh, three part uh, special private session with Michael, the guy that we're learning from right now. I went down to Nashville, Tennessee. We spent uh, time making three specific videos on leadership and employee stuff and, and deep complex financial issues and more. That's a $500 uh, teaching by itself. I also have my friend Chris Lambernini's, who a lot of you know. He had a $3 million uh, residential cleaning business in New Jersey. I have uh, over three hours of teaching with him on how to automate, grow, and sell your business. We sold tons of those things by themselves for $150. That's included in the boot camp. I have my, my best-selling book, Window Wealth. That thing's been selling like hotcakes for years all over the world to six different countries. It's included in the boot camp. There's also, as a special bonus for this Ultimate Breakout Session training, Chris Lambernini is the same guy from the, from the webinar series. He has a $250 book called The Window Cleaning Marketing Blueprint. He's sold tons of them already. And the digital version where you get the downloads and everything, it's 250 bucks. Okay, this is a guy who started from zero and grew his business to doing 300K a month. He knows how to do stuff. He knows how to market his business. And one of the biggest pain points like we talked about tonight was getting new customers. He has dozens and dozens of split-tested proven actual things he did and all the things that didn't work and all the do downloads to go along with those things, you get that for free when you join the boot camp tonight. Okay, when you add up all the little nuggets in here, it's over $5,000 worth of stuff. Okay, it's very high level. It's very powerful. It's not for everybody, but it's for anybody who's hungry because when uh, my business tripled, the year that it tripled, Michael, it was because of an idea, the framework, working on my business instead of in my business. I didn't have all the answers, but that one concept by itself helped me triple my business. Now, what would it do for someone right now if they could have a framework so specialized for the cleaning industry to help their business? I mean, it's beyond measure, the power of this stuff. And I'm not trying to be cheesy. It's just real. It can change your life. It can change everything. Think of all the divorces, all the financial stress. Nobody can pay their stuff. They're getting really bad credit. Look, all of it's fixable. There's nothing irreparably damaged in your business, but you have to have the right roadmap. And the boot camp, my boot camp, is that roadmap for you. Michael, you've seen it. I mean, can you spend a few minutes just telling your opinion of it, how powerful it would be? Uh, the cost of the boot camp, we'll, we'll get to in a second, but what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, my thoughts are when I went in it um, the first time, when I logged in the first time and I started going through the workbooks, it didn't have all these other things even, and it was still extremely valuable. I, I'm thinking of the one where you're on the beach, Josh, and you're talking about building out your labor percentage and what you should pay a technician. And I remember thinking, well, what are I know what we pay our people in commission, but we have these other pay. What should I do? And then you have the ro the customer reward program or the reward program. And I started looking at these things. And even a guy who at that point was running a two and a half million dollar cleaning business with about 60 employees, 
I was looking at it and going, oh my gosh, I need to fix this. And if I just could fix this, and for the cost of a boot camp, I can tell you, I mean, look at, that was a, that was about a year ago, not even now, and we're, we're at about two and a half, now we're about five. Now, it's not all 100% because of the boot camp, but it got me thinking about a lot of the things that I needed to think about. And as we're talking today, I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep tonight, because I'm thinking, I got to take a look at this book on the marketing blueprint thing, that Chris Lamberdini's deal, I got to get that to our marketing guy, because we're still making some mistakes that we got to fix. This customer life cycle thing you're talking about, I no question, if I could get our customer... Uh, if I could get our, if our average ticket was four fifty, oh boy, we're da- we are really rocking and rolling. Um, I might have, uh, you know, I might be hanging out with real country music stars here in Nashville. Then <laughs> it would be really cool. So uh, you know that, and then you're just, I don't, it's not in your boot camp, but just your comment tonight about the, uh, I saw this. No, that whole I'd thing is a section this. of the boot camp. Oh, man. I, mean, I have I, a whole module on employee scripts and how to say these things. I mean, the detail is super deep. And the biggest complaint I get about the boot camp is they feel overwhelmed. And I don't want anyone watching this to feel overwhelmed. That's silly, okay? Make a logical decision here, not an emotional one. You have lifetime access to this. You can schedule your calls with me a year from now. It doesn't matter. But the price of the boot camp is going to go up and up and up as we start building out our community. We have a great core. It's not going to be open all the time. We're going to shut down registration for the boot camp. We're not leaving it open-ended because I work one-on-one with people. But just ask yourself this. If you implemented one thing, do you believe that I'm genuine enough to provide you with one thing that could make you, you know, a couple grand this year. If you could get five two hundred and fifty dollar jobs, you've covered the cost of the boot camp. The the price of the boot camp is only twelve hundred and fifty bucks, okay? And it's eventually going to go to two thousand, and then to twenty five hundred, and then to five thousand as we build out more and make it more sophisticated uh, with some other things we have coming. This is a major opportunity because later when we make these updates, when I fly across the country and meet with high level business leaders and interview them. You get that stuff for free, and it's not available anywhere else on the planet. When I'm building a community, I want you to be a part of it. And you only need to get a few jobs to cover the cost of this. You could do that with one tiny system alone the first two weeks if you really were motivated. Uh, So that the price is kind of laughable in a way, but I really want to get a couple hundred people in here. I want to have a good core before we really try to grow it. And, you know, that's my passion. Uh, My heart and soul has been poured into it. I stand behind it a thousand percent. It has a money back guarantee. It doesn't need it because no one asks for their money back ever. But it has it. Okay. It's there. Um, And again, to make it even juicier, here's the deal for tonight. Because I know we're we're hitting an hour now. Uh, We're going to get off here briefly. If you buy this right now, you can actually break the $1,250 into two payments. So you're going to pay $625 today and then $625 a month from now, and then you're, that's it. And then you, you have it for life. It's yours. This is a major investment in your own framework, just like back in the day when it, I learned about EMath. If I could have had a boot camp like this, I could have had a business twice the size that I had, probably three times the size, because a lot of these things I didn't fully understand until the tail end of when I sold my company. But they're very, 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 very powerful things. And you get the community of people, just the community. To that. The mastermind group alone is worth 1200 bucks. These are smart people. We have people in the boot camp with million-dollar businesses. We have people in the boot camp that buy the boot camp just for their operations manager to go through it. And we also have people in there with $10,000 businesses that are just starting out. It's flexible enough for everybody. You don't have to conquer Rome in one day. Any final thoughts there, Michael? Is that a good deal? Yeah, it's, it's a, it is, I think that you're charging about 5000 too low, um, honestly. I, I, we've gotten our – I think it's relevant for anyone at every stage. And the real cost is getting – five customers. I mean, not five customers. Or if you've got 100 customers already, getting them to get, what, $10 more per job? Um, it's a no-brainer. I, I think that the mastermind group is worth the 1200 personally. And straight talk, being 100% real, Josh, I need to schedule one of my calls with you because that simple customer 
life cycle thing and that recommend deal, that's gonna that's gonna be worth its weight in gold for our company. So as soon as we're done with this, I literally want to schedule my call with you because I that is gonna make us a lot more money and serve customers a lot better too. Yeah, we, we will. And I love talking about this stuff. And the thing is, is that I didn't invent every little thing here. But what I've done is I've framed it and laid it out for you in a way that makes it really, 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 really easy to understand what to do next. And if you're not investing in your education or you're not working on the correct things, you get stuck, man. You get stuck. There's yeah. a guy in the boot camp, 20-year-old business. He's been flat for like seven years. It happens, I mean, all the time. And these little bitty things that I've learned along the way by being mentored by people, by testing things in my business. I had an extensive sales training uh, background before I started my company. That's why I learned a lot of the scripting and the power in those things and the way that you word things. That stuff by itself is highly valuable information. So that's really it. I mean, the offer is here. You can click the link. It's 625 bucks. It's super cheap. You get Chris Lamberdini's book included. If you only got that and, and got just one of the modules, it's worth more than even that. Okay, You get the epic webinar series I did with Chris Lamberdini's. It's kind of like this training, but it's broken into three one-hour deep dive sessions. You get the private sessions with Michael Dalkey, who we're talking to right now, who has, you know, his business can do five million this year. It only did two and a half last year. I think he probably knows some stuff. <laughs> they have some good systems. You get to learn about those. You get the three personal phone calls with me, uh, which is 600 bucks right there because I charge 200 bucks for a, for a phone call. And then the whale fishing video that I use to get a uh, a contract with one of the big three automakers. It took over a year to do it. It was worth over a quarter million. Uh, I teach you how I did that because that's a highly specialized uh, sales cycle. It's a different way to sell if you're looking to get to commercial. There's over 50 sample business documents, the course workbook, the homework guide, my audio book, my window wealth ebook in documents, with which has been sold in six countries, people all over. I have literally a whole Trello board full of testimonials, full, tons of them thanking me for just window wealth. The boot camp is window wealth multiplied by 100 non-steroids. So it's over $5,000 worth of stuff at least. You get it for two payments of six twenty-five. dollars I'm excited to, to work with a lot of you guys. I've met a lot of you at the convention. Uh, I'm hungry to serve and to help in any way that I can. I know that you're hungry to make a change and get serious about your business. This is the right time. Make it happen. We can work together. Michael, I appreciate your time. We're going to stay on and, and keep live chatting with you guys. Um, I am going to stop the video feed here in a minute unless you have some you know, really epic closing words for us, Michael. You no, know, I just want to say on the live chat, I think Josh said it best. you got to figure out what the next step is for you and connect that to an area in the boot camp. So me and Josh both being th through the boot camp um, – if you got a, if you want to send in a quick chat request here, I think uh, if you don't know what that next step is for you, and you don't know if the boot camp has the connecting, uh, the something that connects you to that next step, or that can help you with that next step, just shoot a quick message here and say, hey, you know what, I'm stuck with this. I, I'm my credit cards are maxed out. I don't know what to do, or I just can't quite break through that marketing issue or this employee issue. And if, and if it's in the boot camp, we can point you to the right direction and get you in the right spot. So that whatever that next, you think that next step is, let us help connect that in the boot camp or at least give you some advice while we're here on the live chat tonight. I'm yeah, happy absolutely. to help. Absolutely. I'll stay on as long as I have to. I'm happy to help. Um, and I've got no incentive to do that other than just trying to help people out. Um, so I, I no, will and Michael, you get nothing it. for doing any of this. I just want to be clear about that. You just you're serving and giving, and you don't have a thing to sell. And you know we've become friends, but the, everything you're saying is genuine. I want everybody to know that uh, the material is real. It's hard hitting. It's it's totally worth it. Yes, I have the thing to sell. That's my passion right now. Michael's running a really big business still. I'm down in Costa Rica playing with the monkeys down here. <laughs> I'm, I'm a pink scooter. Which is not not only do I not have anything to sell, Josh, but I, this call cost me a 12-pack of Diet Coke that I have to air freight to Costa Rica. <laughs> so this is actually negative for me, but it'll actually, when we put these things in place, and I guarantee you on Monday morning, that's the first message going out to my production managers is tell your guys big focus in September is going to be on upsell. If I, I, I noticed this. 
I'd recommend this. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you, Michael. Guys, we'll be on here chatting with you. Um, but you need to know that the registration for this is going to close in about a week. And then that will be it. And it will not reopen until the winter sometime. Um, so just know that. The time is now. And the price will be more. So thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Derek. Derek works his butt off to make all the technical side of this stuff work. Uh, it's very complicated to put one of these events together, but it's easy for him because he's a super nerd. So thank you, Derek. I appreciate you, buddy. Uh, we'll be on here chatting. Have a good night, Michael. I'll talk to you soon, and, and we'll hop on the phone and do whatever we got to do next. Absolutely. God bless.